please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Melissa Schilling. Thank you very much. Hi, thanks for having me and thanks for being here. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what makes someone a spectacular, a spectacularly innovative person. And I'm gonna focus on serial breakthrough innovators. So I'm not really gonna talk much about the one hit wonders, even though one big idea is very important. I wanna focus on people who innovated over and over again in their lives, because then we can identify those things that are common to the person as opposed to something special about the context. And I started asking myself this question about Eight years ago, 2010, because I had a lot of students coming up to me at that time and saying, what's going to happen at Apple? Steve Jobs didn't look very well, and students were worried. They wanted to know how much of the innovation actually came from him and how much of that was a myth, how much of it was in the routines and structure of the firm. They also wanted to know if it came from him, where did it come from? Is it something that could be passed down or learned? Uh, was it innate? Was it, how much was nurture versus nature? And I thought, it's surprising that we don't have great answers to that question. Innovation and creativity has been a hot area of research for a long time, but we don't tend to study outliers. And in part, it's because there's methodological challenges for that. So I put together a multiple case study research project to, to tackle this problem. And uh, one of the things I want to point out is that once you understand what makes someone a serial breakthrough innovator, you also understand how to nurture the breakthrough innovation potential in all of us, our employees, our children, ourselves. Because very often, between some trait or personal experience that shaped the innovator and the innovative outcome, there's a mechanism that we can all take advantage of. So that's what I'm going to highlight today is four themes that came out of my research and how we can take advantage of it in our own personal lives and in our workplaces. I want to start by pointing out that what really prompted a multiple case study research project is that I spent a year studying just Steve Jobs. I wanted to know what he was like as a person, what his hopes were, what his dreams were, what his cognitive biases were, what his formative experiences were as a child. And a very weird thing happened in that process. And that is that I saw he had some commonalities with another innovator, Dean Kamen, who I'd already written a case about for my textbook. Now, Dean Kamen, some of you won't automatically know who he is, a lot of you will. He invented the world's first portable drug infusion pump. So if you've ever seen a, a type 1 diabetic with a pump that automatically administers insulin under the skin, that's Dean Kamen's invention. He also invented the world's first portable dialysis machine, which was a revolutionary medical innovation that liberated people from having to sit at the hospital all day. He also invented a wheelchair that can climb stairs and can stand on two wheels and balance by rapidly rotating its wheels back and forth, which is actually shifting its weight the way you do as a, as a bipedal animal. And what he, they, he then used that technology, the balancing technology, for, to create the Segway personal transporter, which I'm sure you've all heard of. So that's Dean Kamen. Dean Kamen is an unusual guy, and remarkably, some of his unusual traits are very similar to Steve Jobs, and that's what inspired me to put together a multiple case study research project. I set up a protocol that would identify serial breakthrough innovators that were widely recognized for creating more than one serial breakthrough innovation. And let's just deal with something right away up here. I got 30 people from this protocol, and they were all basically white, and there was only one woman in the set. Now, I, uh, I have to say that this, at this time and age, it is not a great time to be writing a book about seven white men, as I'm sure you can imagine. And I anticipated there being a lot of pushback, and I initially fell victim to this trap of digging for diversity. So I was looking for more women. I was looking for people of color. I was trying to see what, what I had missed. Then I realized at some point I wasn't doing science anymore because as a scientist you have to stick with your protocol and you can't hand select your cases or you're introducing bias into it. So it's more important that we figure out why there's only one woman in the set because we can't change the past, but we can change the future. So let's just deal with that really quick up front. Even though our memories are relatively short and we tend to perceive the world around us as being pretty egalitarian regarding genders, 
This is a relatively recent phenomenon. When Marie Curie was a college-age student, most universities in Europe didn't allow women in them. She had to travel to France uh, as a young woman with money she saved up as a governess to attend the Sorbonne, a governess, to attend the Sorbonne because the university in Warsaw, where she grew up, didn't allow women. Most universities didn't allow women. In fact, even when universities in Europe started allowing women, at first they wouldn't give them degrees. Women were only allowed to sit in on the classes, but they couldn't earn degrees. And then when they started being able to earn degrees, there were quotas that limited how many women could be in a class. Isn't that interesting? Quotas to limit the women. It actually wasn't until 1972 in the United States, and that's really recently, that we had a law that said it's illegal to have sexual discrimination in higher education. Uh, and there's still plenty of areas in the world where women don't have equal access to education, science, or business. So this is, a, this is a big part of why we don't see that many women in the set. This is just for fun. This is a photo of the Solvay Conference in 1911. And you see it's a sea of men. That's Albert Einstein, a young Albert Einstein over there on the right. And then you see Marie Curie, the only female there, going, oh. <laughs> All right, so let's talk a little bit how much breakthrough innovation is nature, nurture, or luck. We're going to find that it takes all three. There's also going to be a lot of people that have all of these characteristics that seem to have everything going for them, and they still don't get recognized as serial breakthrough innovators. So my basic premise is going to be there are a lot more serial breakthrough innovators out there than we have acknowledged and recognized yet. And there's also more serial breakthrough innovation potential in most of us. And I'm going to talk about four themes. The first one is sense of separateness. So one of the most remarkable things that started coming out in this research, and I have to say it's not what I expected, because I'm a network researcher, and I thought these people would be super connected with lots of diverse connections. I was wrong about that. Every single person I studied, with the exception of Benjamin Franklin, had this strong sense of separateness, a feeling of detachment, a feeling that they didn't belong to the social world or that its rules didn't apply to them. And Albert Einstein probably articulated it the most clearly. He wrote at length about feeling detached from people. He said things like, I love humanity, but I'm very detached from individual humans. I don't need direct contact with individual humans, not even my family, which is an unusual thing to say. Uh, and he said, here, I gang my own gait, and I've never fully belonged belonged uh, to my country, my home, my friends, or even my family with my whole heart. But, he points out, wait, sorry, one slide back. Wait, no, we have, okay. Okay, such a person no doubt loses something in the way of geniality and lightheartedness, but on the other hand, he's largely independent of the opinions, habits, and judgments of his fellow and avoids the temptation to take his stand on such insecure foundations. So he's got a hypothesis here about how separateness makes him a more independent thinker. And when you think about the fact that he had a very hard time getting into academia. As a college student, his professors didn't like him. They found him disrespectful and slovenly, and he often didn't come to class, or he came into class late. And they wouldn't write letters for him to get a job. So when he tried to get a job as a, as a professor, he says that every single physics department in Europe turned him down. And he went and became a patent examiner instead. But he continued to write and research and, and do work on physics anyway as an outsider. And because he was an outsider, he didn't do what the rest of us academics are trained to do, which is to pay homage to the work that has gone before, right? Cite everybody that you're supposed to cite, build on the existing lacuna of knowledge. This is what you have to do as an academic, to get published, to get cited, to get expected, to be legitimate. Uh, he didn't do it. He just cast aside all of these concepts from Newton and said, no, it's wrong. There's no ether. There's no absolute time. He basically cleared the slate and developed revolutionizing ideas in physics that really broke with tradition. So the fact that he felt separate from the rest of academia enabled him to do something really different. And as you can expect, at first, the academic world was not thrilled about it. Right? So at first, the response was decidedly chilly. Then Max Planck ended up writing that he thought that there was great merit in the work, which brought some people around. Then there was a solar eclipse that enabled them to test one of his theories about light bending with gravity, and that changed everything. The tide turned, and people realized that Albert Einstein was a genius. Now, 
A lot of these innovators had this separate trait. Pierre and Marie Curie talked about wanting to live apart from the world of human beings. They talked about wanting to live an anti-natural existence. They even took their two daughters and gave them to Pierre's father to raise so that they could focus entirely on science. And that's an interesting choice. Eve Curie, Marie Curie's daughter, wrote a biography about her mother after her mother's death. And in it, you hear the love and the respect and the adoration, but you also feel the pain and the longing and the sadness. They pined for their parents' attention. And so there was a really sad and difficult choice that Marie Curie felt like she had to make to be a woman of science. On the other hand, this, when, when you don't believe the social world's rules apply to you, you are free to do things that the social world says are impossible. So, for instance, when Dean came and said he was going to invent a wheelchair that could balance on two wheels, people said it's impossible. And he fired back and he said, don't tell me it's impossible. Tell me you can't do it. Tell me it's never been done. But the only things we really know are Maxwell's equations, the three laws of Newton, the two postulates of relativity, and the periodic table. That's all we know that's true. The rest are man's laws. So he's sweeping a whole bunch of science into the corners and saying, you know what, don't assume that that's right. Be willing to break with tradition. So what can we learn from this? First thing we have to learn is that we need norms that permit people to be unorthodox. We need to be able to embrace weirdness. It, it, we have to at least tolerate weirdness. We have to get rid of pressure to achieve consensus. Uh, one of the most damaging things that firms inadvertently do, you see it all the time, and it seems really natural. You wouldn't even suspect it of being the wrong thing to do. So they'll have a team working on a brainstorming and innovation, and they'll say, pick an idea, choose an idea for us to follow, right? But in those words, pick an idea, they have signaled we have to agree on one. And the minute a team knows they have to agree on one, that changes even the ideas they put out there, right? If I'm on this team, I'm thinking, well, I have these wild and crazy ideas, but I'm never going to get consensus on them. So I'm only going to put out the ideas that have a strong potential for consensus, which, by the way, are the ideas that are already probably shared by the rest of the group, right? And if nobody likes my idea, I'm going to start shaving off the corners of it and making concessions. I'm not going to fight for something unusual because, after all, we need to pick an idea. So don't do that. Don't say that to teams. In fact, get rid of brainstorming teams if what you want is innovation. Because brainstorming teams cause people to come to mediocre compromises. You need to let people work separately first. You need to encourage them to put out their wildest stuff and commit to it and elaborate it. All right, you, you, you don't want them to form everything in a group. Second trait that came across in all the innovators extremely strongly was self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is a task-related form of self-confidence. So it's, it's a narrower than self-confidence. Someone could seem not confident and yet have very high self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is that faith you have that you can overcome obstacles to achieve your goals. And it makes you take on bigger projects and persist with them longer in the face of obstacles. And, uh, and to persist, to be resilient. And to me, the icon of self-efficacy is Elon Musk, right? Elon Musk finds out that NASA isn't going to take us to Mars and thinks that that's just that's a terrible thing. So he decides, well, he'll roll up his sleeves and he'll do it himself, right? Which is incredible, incredible self-efficacy. And then when he tells the space industry, the key is going to be reusable rockets. I'm going to create reusable rockets. The whole space industry says, what, you think we didn't think of that? We thought of that, right? We've spent 50 years trying to create reusable rockets. The whole space industry's rocket science expertise has been working on this problem. We haven't been able to do it. You're not going to be able to do it. He's like, I think I can do it. And as you all know, he did it. Ah, man, it's pretty powerful self-efficacy. It's not just that he's built some exciting things. He's like a walking moonshot. He sees a problem, and he has faith that he can solve it if he just applies himself long enough and hard enough. That is something exactly, almost exactly the words that Einstein used, almost exactly the words that Marie Curie used. And this guy, Nikola Tesla, right, who I'm sure all of you know, when he was 14, he, told, he saw a postcard with a drawn picture of Niagara Falls. 
He's living in Smiljan, Croatia, a little farming village in Croatia, and his father's a Serbian Orthodox minister. So he was pretty far away from Niagara Falls, pretty far away from a technological center of any kind. And he says to his father, you know, Father, I'm going to build a giant water wheel under that cataract that will harness the power of the, of the waterfall and shoot energy around America. And his father was like, okay, great, I guess. You know, I wasn't there to actually see what his father said, so I spent a lot of time speculating on, on what his father's face looked like at that moment. But as most of you know, within two decades, he did exactly that. He built the AC power station at the base of Niagara Falls and demonstrated for the very first time that power could be so powerful that it could be fired hundreds of miles and really change the world as we know it. So what are some of the implications of this? Self-efficacy is like a superpower. It won't just make you more innovative, it'll make you more productive, it'll make you have a greater sense of well-being. We should be looking to cultivate self-efficacy in ourselves, in our children, in our employees all the time. And one of the key ways you get self-efficacy is through early wins. So experiencing that process of overcoming an obstacle to achieve your goals. And one of the key ways to ensure that people more experience, or experience more early wins is to lower the price of failure, right? Encourage people to try even if they fail. Be like Eli Lilly and throw a party for your greatest failures every year, right? Throw a party that says, that was a wonderful failure. Look what we learned from that failure. Because you want to signal people that it's more important to err by commission than omission. You also, uh, you want to be careful about rescuing people. So suddenly, sometimes you see an, a colleague or your kids struggling with something a little bit. And your instinct is to jump in there and help them. Because that's nurturing, right? And that's going to reinforce social bonding. That feels like the right thing to do. But you know what? You might be undermining an opportunity for them to develop self-efficacy. So sometimes the best thing you can do is just stand back and say, I have faith in you. You got this. You're going to get this and let them get it themselves. It's important. Now, early wins, you, you have to kind of hopefully stumble into, but there's a super cool trick we can take advantage of because there's another way that we build self-efficacy that's pretty powerful, and it's a way that we sort of hack our social mammal brain. So as a social mammal, you are wired for social learning. And that's extremely useful because that means when that guy over there eats some berries and dies, you realize, oh, I'm not going to eat those berries. <laughs> that's fine. You, you don't have to go experience that lesson firsthand, right? Social learning is extremely efficient, and humans are wired for it. All social animals are wired for it. We call it vicarious learning in psychology. And it turns out you get a lot of your self-efficacy, your faith in your ability to overcome obstacles to achieve goals through vicarious learning, which means one of the cool shortcuts you can take is to read hero stories. Read stories about entrepreneurs, read stories about innovators, read stories about people who overcame personal challenges. Because every time you see somebody else who you can remotely identify with overcome obstacles to achieve their goals, there's a part of your mammalian brain going, yeah, I can do that too. And uh, there's, there's eight hero stories in this book, so this is a good place to start. <laughs> All right, third one. Seven out of the eight I, uh, innovators I studied had an intensely important idealistic goal that mattered more to them than just about anything else. It mattered more than money. It mattered more than reputation. It mattered more than comfort and leisure. Sometimes it mattered more than their health. It, and sometimes it mattered more than their families. Now, an idealistic goal is a powerful intrinsic motivator. It can fuel you and motivate you to work really hard. It also keeps you focused, and it can give you a longer range of vision. If you were trying to solve some important problem for humanity, it, you can think bigger, right, when you're focused on that goal. It also makes you more resilient, because if you believe you're working for something bigger than you, you can endure more criticism without taking it personally, or endure, in some cases, more pain or suffering because you believe believe the cause is important enough. So the innovator in my set who I talk the most about with idealism is Benjamin Franklin. He was a keenly idealistic person. He had a whole set of virtues that he wrote about that became one of the most widely distributed documents of his time. He also spent most of his life working towards a free and egalitarian America. And he even at one point severed relationships with his son because his son was a British loyalist. So he chose his ideal even over his family. 
but all of the innovators in my set, with the exception of Edison, which is an interesting case, seven of the, uh, the, the other seven innovators had an important idealistic goal they were pursuing. So this is Dean Kamen again. I mentioned the medical innovations. One of his more recent innovations is the slingshot water purifier, which can turn anything wet into potable drinking water. And the way he demonstrates this at conferences is he urinates into it and then he drinks it, which is pretty convincing, I think. Uh, <laughs> But it turns out not a lot of corporations wanted to line up to buy this thing because the countries that need clean drinking water are the countries where people don't spend, don't have a lot of money. So he ended up putting 50 million of his own into it. And he's a relatively small company and people said that's a lot of money to spend on such a risky project. And he said, I just believe in it. It might fail, but you've got to try. Look at the state of the world. It's a mess. What if we can fix it? Now you hear the idealism in his words. You can also hear the idealism in these words. I'm interested in things that, that change the world or, or that affect the future. How did you figure you were going to start a car company and be successful at it? Well, I, I didn't really think Tesla would be successful. I thought we would most likely fail. But you say you didn't expect the company to be successful? Then why try? If something's important enough, you should try, even if you, the, the probable outcome is failure. If something's important enough, you should try, even if the probable outcome is failure. What are the implications of this? You know, if you want people to come up with breakthrough innovations and you want them to think really big, or you want to find more meaning and in breakthrough innovation in your own life, start cultivating I ambitious, idealistic goals. And at your organization, you can search for the noble cause in your mission. So for example, it's not nearly as motivating if we say we want earnings to go up by 10% this quarter versus if we say we want to find a solution to, to global hunger or to cure cancer. When you have an idealistic goal that people in your company can identify with, they're going to work harder, they're going to work longer, they're going to think bigger, and they're going to love it more. Super, super valuable. You can also use credible commitments that signal this mission is more important than profit. So for example, Musk's decision not to take SpaceX public until Mars is secure, because he knows a board of directors would be likely to make compromises that would make it less likely to get to Mars. When he announced to his employees, we will not take the company public until Mars is secure, that was a pretty credible commitment. Forfeited a lot of personal wealth generation to himself and to his employees. Uh, but he wanted to signal how important the ideal was. Okay, last piece. How much does timing and luck matter? Uh, right time, right place. It, it matters. It matters a lot. Uh, Steve Jobs talked about the fact that he felt incredibly lucky to be at exactly the right time, at exactly the right place for the personal computer to come about. And in fact, there's a whole interesting story in the book about the Tizard mission. It's fascinating. It should be a movie that shows that so many little things that could have gone wrong, like like uh, the, the Churchill not deciding to send the magnetron from England to the United States during World War II, or the ship getting sunk, or Bill Shockley's mother getting sick in Palo Alto. All these little things had to happen for Silicon Valley to exist. And if any single one of them had not happened, Silicon Valley would probably not be the heart of technological innovation for the United States. Maybe not, we, the heart of technological innovation might not even be in the United States, and we would not know Steve Jobs' name. So there's, there's lots of material in the book that I can't share here because I don't have that much time. But let's talk about the resources that did matter. First, let's eliminate one assumption I had. I thought capital would matter, access to capital, because I work at a business school. We spend a lot of time thinking about venture capital, angel seed funding, uh, financial markets, lending, grants. We, this is what we focus on, because well, it just makes sense for us. That was not the explanation for these people. Every single one of these people that, my, that the protocol selected, I didn't select them myself, started out flat, broke. Every single one of them, like virtually no money. Even Musk, who some people perceive as affluent, he ran away from home when he was 17 because his father said he would only pay for him to go to college in Pretoria, South Africa. So he got his mother's passport and managed to get himself a passport and got to Canada on his own and worked on a farm to put himself through college. Every single one of these guys started broke. They, didn't, they did not become innovators because they had access to capital. Now, they were working in economies that had smart people and access to capital. So that can be important. In fact, the resource I found to be most important here was these people's access to other people who had resources or expertise they needed. Uh, so 
one of the things we can learn from this is don't assume that money is gonna solve the problem and don't assume that money's the crucial resource that either holds us back or enables us in innovation. It's usually people, access to technological and expertise resources in the form of other people. So one of the most valuable things you can do is help connect people to the other people they need. Create networks of expertise in your organization. And I don't mean like the old Booz, and Booz Allen Hamilton knowledge networks where you've got some data in a computer. I mean think about what people I need to introduce you to and introduce you to them. Right? And if you want to be an innovator yourself, stop looking for money. Start looking for the people who can help you enact your ideas. Ideas come from individuals, but ideas get enacted by teams and organizations and groups of people. Uh, we also should really learn from this study that very often the person who's a breakthrough innovator in a field is not the person who's extremely well trained and specialized in that field. That person is super important for executing an innovation and building a system around it, but that person is also often trapped in the paradigms and logic of the field. It very often comes from outsiders. Disruptive innovation often comes from outsiders, people who appear to lack the education or expertise or official authority to innovate in a field are often the ones who disrupt it. So we have to be really open to that, right? We have to, we have to find ways to enable nonlinear careers. We have to encourage people to study topics that, that they don't have PhDs in. And one of the things I gotta say, it's not actually on this slide, but one of the things I think I learned the most from this study, a lot of these people didn't have as much education as you would expect, but they were self-educators. They were ravenous readers, and they would pick a topic and they would master it and work in that area without being given permission by some organization that, that, that had accredited them. So I, I, I love that. It means that we, any of us can pick something we wanna master and study and choose to innovate in that area. Uh, again, there's so much more in the book than I could present here, but I'm really glad I got an opportunity to talk with you about it, and uh, thank you for having me. Thank you, Melissa.